For today's set of notes, I wanted to start with a question. In a single organism, we have tons of different cells, but all the cells should have the same DNA. So why in a living organism, such as a human, do we have so many different cell types if all have the same DNA? You can even see on the screen here, we have skin cells, blood cells, immune cells. They look different in shape, size, color. What's the reason for this if we're all using the same instructions? Well, the answer comes from today's topic, protein synthesis. So in today's notes, we'll go through what protein synthesis is and how we get these different cell types from the same strand of DNA. For today's notes, we're gonna start with what's called the central dogma of protein synthesis. Then we're gonna go through the three steps of protein synthesis and the components, DNA, RNA, and protein. Then the actual stages in which protein synthesis takes place called transcription and translation. You can pause at each slide to fill in the guided notes found in the description below, or you can watch the notes straight through. So protein synthesis is a process where we take the arrangement of nitrogenous bases. This is the actual code and information of DNA. And we take a section of it. This section is called a gene. So we're gonna take a section of DNA, the gene, and code it for a sequence of another molecule called amino acids. When you make a sequence of amino acids, you make a protein hence the name protein synthesis. We basically are asking how do we get from this information, this blueprint, to an actual final product. This happens through what's called the central dogma of cellular biology. Dogma means principle or main idea. So this is sort of the theme of all of what happens in cells. And that's how we take genes from our DNA, read and express them. The central dogma is that we always go from DNA to RNA to protein. This is happening in animals, plants, all living organisms of how we get from our information to our final product. So we're gonna go through each part of the central dogma and talk a little bit about what each molecule is like and what it has. So the first one is DNA. This is your blueprint. It contains all the information that a single organism needs to live, to function, to survive. The information is found on the inside of DNA in what's called the nitrogenous bases. We have four of them, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. These four bases are found in all DNA across all living organisms. This is why it's called the universal code. Now, these four letters might not seem like much, but the arrangement of them and how many A's you have versus how many C's and in what pattern they go is what gives us the variety of life that we have. Now, for eukaryotic cells like plants and animals, this DNA is going to be stored inside the nucleus. And it's important we remember that when we get to the process of protein synthesis. DNA is also double-stranded. So being double-stranded in the nucleus is important to remember. Now the next part is RNA, which is sort of the cousin of DNA. They are both nucleic acids, so they have a lot of things in common. If DNA is the blueprint, the actual guide to how we're going to build something, RNA are gonna be the construction workers. They're going to be the molecules that take this information and make it useful so that we can start building something. So RNA is what carries the information from DNA that's in the nucleus out to ribosomes, which are gonna be our protein factories. So this is where we're gonna read and use this information to make those proteins. Like I said, RNA is like the cousin of DNA. So it has some similarities, but it also has some differences. It is single-stranded, so it doesn't have that double helix. It is a single helix shape. It also has four bases. Three of them stay the same, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. However, you noticed 
However, you will notice there is no thymine, the T. We now have what's called uracil. In protein synthesis, there are three types of RNAs that are essential. So we're gonna go through those. The first is called messenger RNA, which is abbreviated mRNA. This is the RNA that gets the information from DNA and then goes out from the nucleus to the ribosomes. That's why it's the messenger. It's going to take that information from the DNA and send it as a message to the ribosomes. The second RNA we need to recognize is called transfer RNA, and it's abbreviated tRNA. It's folded into what's called a hairpin shape. Now, I've drawn it at the bottom here in the center, that green RNA. To me, it's always had sort of a trumpety looking like shape, but this is called a hairpin shape, and this is what the tRNA looks like. It will actually carry the amino acids in this top part here, which I will show you later on when we get to the stages of protein synthesis. The final RNA that we need to recognize is called ribosomal RNA, which is abbreviated rRNA. Makes it nice and simple, it's just the first letter of the word that goes with RNA. So rRNA is in this globular shape, which I wasn't able to do very well, but it's folded into sort of a blob shape, and it's what makes up the ribosomes. So if you've studied cells, you should remember that ribosomes are where proteins are made. And now we know the components that actually make up ribosomes are RNA. The final part of the central dogma is protein. So if DNA is the blueprint and RNA is our construction workers, protein are our materials to actually build our final product, which in this case is an organism. So proteins are going to be a chain of amino acids. These amino acids are bonded together, and these bonds are called peptide bonds, which is also important to remember for when we go through the process of protein synthesis. Each protein is going to have a unique sequence of amino acids, just like each organism's DNA has a unique sequence of nitrogenous bases, proteins are unique with their sequence of amino acids. Then, these chains of amino acids can fold into specific shapes, giving us those final proteins. Proteins give us a lot of our structural components, our muscles, bones, hair, feathers, um, nails. They also are going to provide us with enzymes. These are proteins that make our biochemical reactions possible. So these are final products that are materials we can use to build an organism and have these chemical reactions take place. So now that we know the players involved in the central dogma of protein synthesis, let's, let's talk about how they all work together. Protein synthesis is a two-step process. The first step is called transcription. This is where we are taking that segment or section of DNA and making an mRNA. Translation is going to start with mRNA, and we're going to read it and build the amino acids into the correct sequence, making our protein. So we're gonna start with going through the steps that happen in transcription. So enzymes, like I said, are going to speed up chemical reactions and make them possible for us to survive. So one of those enzymes is called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is going to bind to a region of DNA called a promoter. So DNA is very long and has all the information of an organism. So in a single cell, the RNA polymerase needs to recognize the section specific to that cell. So the RNA polymerase is going to recognize it using this promoter. Once it gets to the section or gene that it needs, it's actually going to unwind the DNA. So DNA is in that tight double helix that we talked about, and it's going to open up that DNA into two strands. The strands are gonna be labeled the template and the non-template, which should be pretty clear. One we're going to read and the other one we're going to leave alone. 
So the template is going to be the one that is red. So once the DNA is open, we're going to take the, D, the, the template DNA and read it and construct an mRNA. Now we're going to use the nucleotides to build RNA, and we're going to do that using our binding rules. Adenine now goes to uracil. So if RNA polymerase sees an adenine on DNA, as it builds the mRNA, it's going to put in an adenine. The rest of the rules stay the same as when we're making DNA. Cytosine will now go to guanine, thymine will now go to adenine. And this is going to be how we construct that messenger RNA. Once the mRNA is complete, we've read the whole gene, it's going to detach and undergo a process called mRNA processing. So in DNA, there are sections that are coding sections, things that are going to be read and make proteins. And these are called exons. There's also going to be what we would call waste or areas that are not going to code. I don't want to call them waste because there's still studies into why we have these sections of DNA and they might have some importance. But in the process of protein synthesis, they don't. So these are called the introns. So the introns are going to be removed and then the exons are going to be called what's spliced together. So if you look at the bottom here, I have our RNA strand, we have our red and blue sections. The red are the exons, the blue are the introns. We're going to cut out this intron and then we're going to splice the two exons together. This is also going to be done by enzymes, these important proteins. After we have our exons spliced together, we're going to add a five prime cap and a poly A tail, which is just multiple adenines at the end. Both of these are going to help make sure that the mRNA doesn't degrade or get harmed after it leaves the nucleus, and the five prime cap will even help it find where the ribosome is. Now, once the mRNA is complete, and it's processed, it will be able to leave the nucleus. If you remember earlier I said, it's important we remember that we're in the nucleus and DNA is double-stranded. That's because DNA can't get out because there are pores. That double-stranded width of DNA is too large. And so it's protected and inside the nucleus. mRNA being single-stranded is thin enough to fit through those pores and exit. And that's why we need this messenger. The DNA can't get out, but mRNA can. Once the mRNA is complete and has left the nucleus, we are finished with the process of transcription. So step one is complete. We're now going to go to translation. So the mRNA is going to attach to the ribosome. So you can see here that it's going to go in between the top and bottom part of the ribosome. As it slides through the ribosome, it will be read three nucleotides at a time. So this is the way that ribosomes are able to read and process mRNA, only three at a time. So a set of three nucleotides is called a codon. So we're going to go through and read it codon by codon. Now, those transfer RNAs, the tRNAs that have that hairpin shape are floating around the cells carrying amino acids, which is represented by this blue circle here. So the tRNA that has the correct amino acid is going to arrive at the ribosome. How does it know it has the correct amino acid? Well, it is going to have nitrogen bases just like the mRNA. It is going to have on this bottom part here three that are exposed called an anticodon. So whatever the codon says, the corresponding nitrogen bases of the anticodon will match. So if this says A, U, G, a U, an A, and a C at the bottom of one tRNA is going to direct it. This anticodon is going to match a specific amino acid. So this anticodon will help connect it to the correct codon, and now the amino acid is brought in the right order. Now, 
this is going to continue happening. A second tRNA is going to arrive with the next codon using its anticodon. Once the amino acids, two, at least two, are in place, a peptide bond is going to form. That's the, the bond between two amino acids. And that's going to allow the first tRNA to leave and the second tRNA to move over as the mRNA continues to be read. This cycle keeps repeating until we have what's called a polypeptide. I said to remember that peptide is the bond between amino acids, and that's because a polypeptide just means multiple peptide bonds, and that's what the chain of amino acids is called. Once this polypeptide is complete, we've read the full mRNA, it can detach and leave the ribosome, and now it has the ability to fold into the protein shape that it needs to be. So that is the entire process of transcription and translation. So the question is, how do we have the same DNA in all of our cells, but so many different cell types? And that's because DNA has all the information that we could want, but each cell doesn't need all the information, it just needs the section for that cell. So using protein synthesis, we go and take the section that we care about, the skin cells will go to the skin section of DNA. The eye cells will go to the eye section of DNA. And we're gonna transcribe that information into an RNA that can then take that information out from the DNA and make it usable. Again, our construction workers that are taking that information and utilizing it. Then, in translation, this RNA is going to be read and we're gonna get our materials, our building blocks, these proteins. So we're gonna translate from RNA into a protein. Once you have the proteins, the materials, you will build what you need. So what the skin cells need is going to be different than what the blood cells need or the immune cells. So we're gonna build the proteins specific to that cell, giving us our different shapes, sizes, and structures, and giving us all of the different types we see, and a complete organism. So I hope this was helpful on the breakdown of protein synthesis. If you have any questions or would like me to address something, please leave a comment and hope you watch more notes.